Hi, I'm Rachel, um, and I'm a mom, and that is why I'm here to speak to you today and share my family's journey. Um, it has been so surprising, as life often is, and um, sometimes I say that we raised our deaf child right by doing everything wrong, everything wrong. Um, our story starts uh, almost 15 years ago. I was a singer, a songwriter, a performer. I played guitar in my band, and I actually played until I was about eight and a half months pregnant with my electric air and acoustic guitar coming flat off the top right here. Um, and my, my daughter, Leah, was born, and she was such an amazing baby. She was so beautiful and so well-behaved. We could take her anywhere. Band practice, she'd sleep right through it. She was just... just so great. And I was a stay-at-home mom, and I read her stories and took her to the zoo and did all the things that you do with, with your babies. And I took her to her one-year well-baby visit. And her pediatrician asked, um, you know, how was her vision? And I said, oh, it's great. She picks up everything off the floor and eats it. It couldn't be better, you know. How about her hearing? I said, well, it's hard to say because a lot of times she totally ignores me. And other times, you know, I know she hears me. And I was, a, I was about to leave, and he said, Rachel, does she have any words? Now, this was kind of my little secret, my, my poor parenting secret. Leah had no words, nothing. And uh, he said, well, no, not mother, you know, or water. Does she say mama and dada? And I said, no, she doesn't say anything. Um, I've noticed when we're in the grocery store and she's in the cart, and what do you do when you see a baby in the cart? You come up to him and say, hi. And people will come up to her and say, hi. And she looks right at them raises her eyebrows, smiles, and goes, no voice, no air. And I would sit in the car with her and say, Leah, say hi, say hi. And she'd look back. And I told him this, and he said, well, that's odd. If she doesn't start talking by about 15 months, then we'll look into it. And so I didn't want to be an over-concerned first-time mom. He's not worried, I'm not worried, and we took Leah home. Uh, later that week, I was at band practice, and my mom had Leah. I was gone for three hours. It was late at night, and I came home. I walked in the front door, and I said, I'm here. And my mom said, come in, but don't let Leah see you and call her name. And I didn't even have to do that. You know, that was enough when your mom says that. Your mom, you know, <laughs> for my heart to hit my shoes and, and to start shaking and come up behind my, my little toddler, my one-year-old, and say, Leah, and have no response. And I said, Mom, how did you know? My mom has raised nine kids. Let me start by saying I'm the middle. I'm number five of nine. And so she raised nine kids, you know, so she's had a lot of experience. Um, my sister came downstairs, turned on a CD. Yes, I know, 15 years ago we had CDs. Turned on a CD, and, and the, uh, the ghetto blaster was on full blast, and everybody screamed and jumped except for Leah. And she kind of had a, a secondary reaction. Everyone, you know, and looked to the baby to see if she'd start crying, and she was kind of looking at everyone, why are you looking at me? So my mom, being, you know, the very smart grandmother she is, did the very diagnostic pots and pans test. And I think our insurance companies could learn a few, you know, tips from my mother. So what you do, in case you don't know, you go get a metal pot, you know, and a wooden spoon, and you sneak up behind the baby, and you bang it. And Leah didn't respond. And so they tried other things. You know, and it was kind of poignant having come home from three hours of music, <laughs> three hours of performing with my band. I put her in the car, and I went home, and I woke up my husband. And I said, Aaron, let me tell you what happened, and you tell me what you think. And so I told him what happened, and he said, you're right. She's deaf. And I said, you know what? I don't want to be right, which was a first probably in our marriage, right? I don't know. This time, no, for this one, I don't want to be right. I don't want to be right. But we started like putting together all this evidence, like, oh my gosh, remember when um, you know, I was in the bathroom and I was, she was whining and I was talking to her the whole time and I was like, I'm just in the bathroom, can I have five minutes in the bathroom? And she kept crying and I came out of the bathroom and she was holding onto the gate looking into the kitchen and whining like I was in the, well, that was fun. There were little quirky, funny things that Leah did a lot. And suddenly they started making sense. Well, I called her doctor because we'd only seen him earlier that week and said, we need to get in here, there's something going on. And um, he checked out Leah and he 
tested her ears, and she had fluid in her ears. Yay, she had fluid in her ears. And suddenly, everybody I knew, their kids had fluid in their ears, right? Everybody, oh, my kid, totally deaf. We put in the tubes, and then they could hear. Just fluid in the ears. So he said, you can put tubes in, or you can put her on an antibiotic. So I said, well, let's just go antibiotic. And we waited 14 days, go back in. She still can't hear, but there's no fluid in her ears. So now what? He says, well, now you need an ABR test. OK. Do we all know what an ABR test is in this room? Anybody not know? OK. They, they put headphones on your baby, put sensors on them. They knock them out. They're out cold and send in sounds and measure the brain waves, and you can't cheat. So you get a, a really true reading. Is that about right? OK. So um, we call the ear, nose, and throat doctor. And, and he's like, we are booked for a month. And I just was like, come on. Because it felt like our lives were on hold, waiting for someone to tell us now what to do. Um, and he's, I said, please put us on a cancellation list. We will be there. We will just run over if somebody cancels. And about two weeks later, somebody canceled. And we got in. But the ENT was in Hawaii golfing. And so the technician could do the test, but couldn't give us the results. And we said, we don't care. We just want to at least get this started. Go in. Well, Leah's asleep in my arms. They put the headphones on. They, you know, and I'm watching this readout. And it's dark. And we're in like this big lazy boy chair, you know, relaxing. And I'm just watching this readout. And I'm, I'm no tech, but I could tell that there wasn't a lot going on. We finished the test. She, she said, you know, I'm, I feel sorry for you guys because he's not here to give you the results. And I know you have to wait another week for him to come back. But Rachel, what do you think is going on? And I said, well, I think she's pretty much deaf. And she said, well, you're pretty much right. And that was the beginning of our journey um, in deafness. He came back a week later. And in the meantime, <laughs> this ENT comes, you know, while he's gone, we're sort of just trying to figure out what to do. I started hearing about these people these like magical special people who would come to our home for free and teach us stuff. But I couldn't imagine where to find them. No one had told us who they were or where to find them. They'll come to your house and they'll teach you like sign language. Who? I opened the yellow pages 14 years ago and started looking. There was the, the Utah School for the Deaf and Blind, but she wasn't going to go to school till she was five, so I didn't want to bother them. And so I just kept you know, trying to figure out how to find these, these people who would come help us. Well, the ENT calls us, and I remember um, <laughs> we were sitting in our car. Leah was in the back seat in her car seat, and he said, severe to profound. And it was like I'd never heard those words before. Suddenly, I didn't even know what they meant. And, I, and they just kept, like, ringing, severe to profound, severe to profound. And, and, like, all these dreams that I'd imagined for my baby She's one, you know, and all these dreams just came crashing down is what it felt like. And she'd never heard a story that I read to her, and she never heard a lullaby that I'd sung to her. And I'd taken her to movies, and I was so embarrassed. Like, I've been with her all day long, every day for a year. And she fooled me, the little stinker. She fooled me. You know, she could do pat a cake. I'd say, how big is Leah? And she'd raise her hands when I said, so big. And she was reading lips, you know? She's so smart. Um, saying hi to people, she figured out, this is something important we do. You come up, you smile, and go, you know? She'd pick that out at a year old, that that's an important thing we do. Erin and I would be sitting having a conversation on the sofa, and she'd come up and just watch us and watch our mouths and just go back and forth between the two of us. And then she'd look at us and go, <laughs> and walk off, which is me. She does a perfect me, ha, 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 and walk away. Um, we sat there on the bed and cried. You know, we cried. And we thought, you know, how could this happen to us? Why us? Why? You know, I'm, a, I'm from a musical family, and I mean really musical. My, my grandmother was one of the King sisters from the big band area, the King family Christmas specials. And yeah, so we're like, we have Christmas to sing. That's what we do. And now here I am with a deaf child and the thought of calling my eight siblings and, my, uh, and the phone tree, you know, the, the, hi, it's Rachel. So guess what? It was just overwhelming. We sat there and cried. And in that moment, we got the most amazing gift that would alter all of our lives forever. Leah was sitting at the end of the bed looking at us with her hands on the bed, and she had the most concerned look in her face, like, Mom and Dad, what happened? Like, what, they're weeping. My parents are weeping? What happened? And she's just looking at us, this beautiful, healthy, wonderful little girl. And I thought for a minute, 
what would I even tell her? We just found out you've been deaf your whole life. You know, I mean, like, what would we even say? She'd be like, yeah, big deal. I've been deaf. My, I'm, I'm doing fine, by the way. You know, <laughs> thanks for the news flash. I've been deaf my whole life, right? And so we really looked at what, could, what would we even say to her? There was nothing wrong in Leah's world. Nothing had changed. She was deaf. She'd been born deaf. She'd been deaf for a year. She did just fine. And I thought, wow, what if nothing's wrong? Like, what if we take Leah's perspective? There's nothing to fix. There's nothing wrong. She's, she's just deaf. She, that's just, I'm short. He's tall. She's deaf. Okay. And maybe we, as the grown-ups, need to learn something new, educate ourselves. And that was the attitude that we took. So I started signing with her. Now she's 14 months old. By the time we actually were like, yeah, she's really deaf, let's sign with her. And it was a really easy decision for us because her eyes worked and her hands worked. And people would stop us. You know, there were people who, oh, I've worked with deaf children before or I've worked with children with disabilities. And you gotta, I understand why you'd want to sign with her, but you really need to be careful because she might never talk. I said, she might never talk anyways. She's deaf. It's not going to be the signing that keeps her from talking. It's deafness. There are a lot of things that delay speech. Signing isn't one of them. Speech delays, <laughs> those delay speech, let me tell you. Deafness and hearing impairments, that delays speech. Autism, Down syndrome, a lot of things delay speech. Signing isn't it. People say, well, it's a crutch. They'll, they'll, they'll use it forever. Um, crutches kind of get a bad rap. You break your leg, what do you need? You need a crutch. When your leg is healed, are you like, no, I really like this crutch, I'm gonna hang on. No, you're so glad to get rid of the crutch, okay? So yeah, maybe sign language is a crutch that you use until you don't need sign language anymore and then you may not use it. Or you might because it's a second language and useful. I've never heard anybody say, do not teach your child English and Spanish. Oh, they can't do it. They're not that smart. They can't do it and it's bad for them too. So American Sign Language is a language. We didn't have that thing that a lot of parents of deaf children have where they say, I want my child to speak. We, a lot, I know a lot of parents get stuck there. They're like, I just want my kid to talk. And they all say, I want my kid to be able to order at McDonald's. I don't know why they say that. They all say that. They say, I want them to order. I want so much more than that. I do. And when people would say that, I would say, no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't want them to talk. You want them to be a critical thinker. You want them to be amazing. You want them to be able to stand on their own two feet. You don't want them just to talk. And very early on, and I don't know why we were able to just see it for what it was, we saw that speech is a skill. And I thought, you know, we could go to speech therapy every day and try and get her to say words. But it sounds like a big waste of both of our time. She can't hear. Why would we take all her spare time and try and get her to say words from a language that she can't even access? She doesn't know and doesn't understand. She's a year old. And so her eyes worked, her hands worked, and we signed with her. And guess what? The coolest thing happened. She started signing back. And she was so good. So of course you start with more, you know, basic more and milk, because all they care about is milk and more, you know, and, and pretty soon, and so 14 months we got the diagnosis. By 16 months, she would come in and sign, Mom, I'm tired. I'm gonna go have a nap. Just a little sleep. Okay, I'll see you later. And she'd go in and put herself down for a nap. And my friends would say, Where did Leah go? And I said, Oh, she's tired, and she put herself down for a nap. And they're like, Rachel, that is not normal. <laughs> and I said, yo, it is. She does it all the time. She's, and they're like, but she knew. She knew the feeling, tired, and she knew what to do when she had that feeling. You put yourself down for, if only we were so smart as adults. I'm tired, but Facebook is calling, you know, at, till, till midnight. And so it was so fun to experience Leah's world, a one-year-old telling us about her world. She couldn't have done that if she didn't sign. Even if she could hear, she couldn't have told us the things that she told us. She'd come in, Mom, I really want a grilled cheese sandwich and I want goldfish crackers. I love you. I'll see you later. I'll be, I'll be watching TV. Just bring it to me, okay? I'm like, okay. You know, all babies start communicating with signs. They do. They wave bye-bye and you never think, don't let them sign bye-bye. They won't ever say it. No, you, are your grandmas and grandpas and parents are like, oh, they're waving bye-bye. You're showing off. You're so, so excited. It never crosses your mind to say, don't let them do that. They all start signing. They point to what they want, and they do this. Eh, eh, eh. What's that mean? 
I want, what do they want? What is it? I know their fuse is about that long, isn't it? You better guess what it is. Because they're pointing at the pantry and they're, say, they're signing to the thing that they want. Eh, eh, eh. And now you start going, don't you? Do you want goldfish crackers? Did you want Oreos? Did you? Because you've got like five guesses before they blow, right? Okay. Yeah, this is a sign for tantrum. Here's the floor. You lay on your back and you kick and scream. Tantrum. I don't teach that one in signing time, you know, for good reason. So, yeah. They know what they want. They know. They're pointing right to it. What is your problem? I'm pointing right to it. And you're guessing. Why not give them signs? When Leah was not even two years old, she had hundreds of signs. And we had hundreds of amazing conversations that you could not have with a two-year-old. We're driving. We moved to Los Angeles from Salt Lake City. And we're driving along. She says, Bobby, Bobby. She, I was Bobby for seven years because... Mommy and Bobby on the mouth look exactly the same. So Bobby, Bobby, and people complain about having to drive with their kids facing backwards. You just try driving around L.A. with a deaf kid in the backseat. Bobby, Bobby, wait for the light. Hold on. Because I need both hands. Because I'm, hold on. And you're adjusting the mirror, and you get to the light. I'm like, what do you want? She's like, Mom, what does L-E-A-S-E -E spell? And she's not too now, if she could hear, she couldn't have asked that because she wouldn't have even been able to say the letters. She couldn't have written them down yet. She may have noticed them and thought, well, those look familiar. But she couldn't have asked what she asked me at two, if you really think about it. And I'm looking around. I'm like, really? You know, there's a big sign that says, for lease. Well, Leah, you know how we have our home and every month we pay to live there. Well, lease that's the same, but for a business, they pay and they have that space and then they all work there. That's, why are we having this conversation year two, <laughs> right? Because, and I imagine we drove along and she looked over and saw L-E-A-S, well, my name is L-E-A-H. That's, that's I, I wonder what that means, you know, very, very, very possible. So she was able to direct and lead conversations that I never, why would you point that out to your two-year-old? No, you, you wouldn't, you know, and she pointed out things to us that were just amazing. Leah did not have a newborn hearing screening. She was born in Salt Lake City, December 1996. And people kept asking, well, didn't she have the screening? Didn't she have the screening? I don't know. I, don't, I was in the hospital, you know, with a new baby, just trying to figure out nursing, you know. Well, she didn't have a screening? I don't know. So I called the hospital. I called the nurses. I called the newborn unit. And finally, somebody called me back and said, and I don't know if this is true or not, but we can do a little research and find out. But what they told me, they said, well, we did a study in January of 1996. January 1st, we started testing every baby that was born, doing the hearing test. We ran the study through the end of November. And in December, we didn't test any babies, but we compiled all of the results from our tests. And we decided it was worth it. And we would test every baby from here on out. I know I have chills starting January um, yeah, she was born in December of 96, and that one month where they weren't testing babies. And I'm okay with that, because I kind of have a feeling how it would have gone if they'd handed me my newborn baby and said, Rachel, she's profoundly deaf. It would have been a mess. I had a year of living with her and treating her like any other kid. And I think that was a real gift to her and to me. Because I got to see, she can have sleepovers with grandma. She can go play with cousins. I would have been like, I, I can't tell her where we're going, that we're ever coming back. How would I explain that to her? She doesn't even understand signs yet, you know? And so we had that year. And then we had the signing. Um, <laughs> my nephew, Alex, was born about the time that Leah was diagnosed. And so my, my nieces and nephews had the benefit of being signed to from birth, where my deaf child didn't. Alex, at five months old, would cry and cry. My sister, Emily, would always sign milk, milk, it's coming, milk, 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 milk. At about six months, he cried, and she signed milk, and he stopped crying because he knew his needs were going to be met. And about eight months, he was crying and crying, and he looked over, and he's like, I've got one of these, too, and he stopped crying. And from then on, he just signed milk when he wanted it. Well, we did have parent-infant program in our home. And we had a deaf mentor, a deaf adult, who came to our home for an hour to two hours every week. It was awesome. They've changed the program quite a bit. 
Um, we were very fortunate at that time. She was a grandma. Her name was Diane. And she would come in, and we'd make cookies, or we'd go to restaurants. She's, and it was voices off. It was sink or swim. And it was scary. And when she would leave, we would have ASL headaches, I'm telling you. After two hours, I'm like, just don't, just, I need to close my eyes and not think, not, you know, translate anymore. But I came up to her one day, and I said, Diane, my nephew Alex signs milk, and he's nine months old. And she's like, yeah, my babies, they were signing when they were six months old. I'm like, why do we not know this? She's like, well, all deaf parents know this. I'm like, well, nice keeping it a secret from us. So, she, so yes, apparently the entire deaf community knows that babies can sign at five, six. She was like, nine months? Pa, we're like five months, you know? I'm like, this is amazing. Every parent should be using this. I don't care if your kid is deaf or not. Signing is an amazing parenting skill for every child. And it's visual, and it's tactile, and it's kinesthetic, and it's three-dimensional, and it's spatial. It basically takes every kind of learning you can have. Like, I'm, I'm a visual learner, and puts it into one. We still use it for spelling words because you don't just have to remember the order of those letters. You can feel it and see it, and it's in your body. So Alex is signing. Leah is signing. I've got, I, I don't even know how many nieces and nephews I have now, 20 plus. They're all signing, you know. Not one of them has delayed speech, by the way. Um, Alex is, not one of them, Alex speaks Chinese as well as Spanish and English and ASL. He plays bass guitar and electric guitar and the piano and is a percussionist. Didn't delay anything. I bet my sister wish it would have, you know, with all that going on. Can we get some delays, please? No, didn't delay speech. Leah? didn't delay her speech, and as we were looking for preschools in the LAUSD system, we actually came into quite a bit of a problem. There was no appropriate placement for a child who had as much language as Leah had. The parent infant program told us when I first met them, and I said, what does it mean that my child is deaf? She said, Rachel, statistically, Leah will graduate from high school with a third grade reading level. She was a year old. And I looked at the woman and I said, what are you doing wrong? Because she can't hear. That's it. It doesn't mean she can't learn. It doesn't mean she can't read. And it doesn't mean that she can't be a contribution to society. This woman worked for the state. And she was telling me that our state school could guarantee in 17 years that Leah would graduate and read like an eight-year-old. And that scared me more than anything, because I knew that I couldn't just pretend that the school system was going to give my child a free and appropriate education. I couldn't just send her to school on the bus and be like, OK, how was your day? I knew it was up to me. And I started watching everything. What do, what do hearing kids know that Leah doesn't know? Rhymes. OK, Leah, hearing people get a big thrill when a word sounds the same. That's a rhyme. How do, you, you know, how do you explain that to a deaf child? Um, I was just, look, shapes. OK, shapes. And I was getting every video I could find. I was getting books. I was trying to figure out how to stay ahead of her, to teach the language to her. We went to visit preschools. We were in LAUSD at the time. And we sat down in an IAP. And I said, I want a teacher who uses ASL. And they said, why? And I said, because it's her first language. And they said, you are the only family that's asking for this. Nobody else cares. Nobody else wants ASL. And I said, well, and they're all going to graduate from high school with a third grade reading level. I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. You know, I said, this is what we want. It's her native language. And they said, it's finally, I mean, I said, we will, we'll, find, we'll find a preschool that just has a deaf teacher. And they said, oh, you're going to change her school every year just depending on her teacher? Do you know what that'll do to her? I said, 18 years old, reading like an eight-year-old. I'm not concerned about what changing schools every year will do to her. I'm not concerned at all. So we went to visit preschools, and we come in, and the teachers loved her. She wasn't even three yet. They loved her. They'd come in, they'd say to me, oh, what's her name? And I'd say, ask her. And they'd go, no. Yeah, ask her. What's your name? My name is L-E-A-H Leah. <gasps> How old is she? Ask her. No. no. <laughs> ask her. She, come on, ask her. Like you've never seen a signing deaf kid before? You're, you teach preschool for deaf children. Ask her. How old are you? 
I'm two. I'm almost three. My birthday, December 8th. No! Nah, how? how? And they'd sit down with her and just start out, what's your favorite color? What do you do? What, uh, just asking her everything under the sun. They're like, we want her in our class. We think she'd be an amazing language model for all of the other kids. I said, I understand that. But where's the language model for my child? So we did find a school that had a deaf teacher. And then we put in her IEP that Leah needed to be in a language-rich environment with her first language. And they all went, oh, that sounds great. Sign, sign. That's perfect. Let's sign this. And so we signed it. And I said, do you know what it means that she needs to be in a language-rich environment with access to her native language? And they said, no. What do you, what do you mean? Her teacher's deaf. I said, yeah, but what's the sound of one hand clapping? You can't learn sign language from one person signing. There has to be a complete language model in the room. And their eyes are, they're all looking at each other. What, what? So we need another fluent signer in the room. So Leah Coleman had a deaf one-on-one -on -one aide in the classroom with a deaf teacher so that all of the children actually could benefit from having a complete language model. You, you can't overhear sign language if one person is signing. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, when kids are in a hearing classroom and they're hearing, and a teacher's saying, well, on the lunch menu, da 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 and half of them didn't pay, everybody's picking up that incidental language. Deaf children don't have that access. If there's one person signing and a hearing person comes in the room, they stop signing and they say, well, you know, lunch today is pizza. Nobody really likes that, and half the kids didn't pay, and the kids totally miss that information. May not seem like important information, but all the information is important information. So, yeah, we had a one-on-one a, a -on -one aide in the classroom, and Leah had a complete language model, and it was awesome. But it wasn't perfect. She'd still come home from preschool, and I would say, what did you do today? And she'd sign, play, bike, eat. And I was like, whoa, whoa. We haven't worked for three years for you to come home. And so I'm, I'm asking you a real question, Leah. And it would take an hour to two hours um, before she'd come back and be signing like herself. That's how the kids at school signed. And she would sit down and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to play a game. I'm the teacher. What does your mom do? And I said, oh, my mom, she lives in Utah. No, no, your mom is home asleep, okay? What's your dad do? Uh, well, my dad, he's, no, no, your dad works. Mom, just copy me. And they'd go around the classroom every morning. What, you know, where's your mom? Mom's asleep. Where's your dad? Dad's at work. What'd you do yesterday? I went swimming. I'm like, she's actually asking a question, Leah. There's, there. No, your mom's not asleep. You know, yeah, your dad is at work, and no, we didn't swim yesterday. But there were the language, the fact that it was language wasn't coming through. It was all by rote. Um, we found a bye-bye school, a bilingual, bicultural school that was opening up, and Leah was too young to actually enter. It was starting at kindergarten. She had one more year of preschool, and we tested her in, and that's where she went to that charter school called Chime. And she was the youngest kid in there, and she held her own. Actually, her placement, when they tested her against the other deaf children, um, they said her language is similar to the third and fourth graders. So she would be with eight-year-olds at age three, which isn't an appropriate placement. And so it, we, it was just a problem that, she, that the system wasn't set up to support a child who had an age-appropriate language and was deaf. In fact, she tested out of special ed because her language was so good, but the only reason she was in is because she happened to not be able to hear anything. Also early on, Leah got hearing aids. Um, she was, you know, she was a year old when we found out she was deaf, and so we said, well, let's get hearing aids. She hated them. She said, they don't help me. They itch, and they just build up wax. And I was like, oh, I've never had hearing aids. I don't know, so that's fine. So she, she stopped wearing them after about three years. And when she was one, they said, no, there, there's something called a cochlear implant that you could do, but she's only one and we don't do them yet. You'll have to come back when she's two or three. And I said, okay. And I wasn't really interested anyway in a cochlear implant because we were doing just fine, you know, and my focus wasn't on her speaking. We were communicating great. And so we didn't even really think about it. Well, life went on and uh, Leah was about, uh, well, she was three years old. She's in preschool and I thought, this is a good time to have another baby because she is on her way. Like, I sign, my husband signs, we're really good at this. You know, we'd meet deaf people and they'd be like, so which of you are deaf? And I'm like, oh, she is. No, no, you or your husband. I'm like, she's deaf. Well, why do you both sign? We're like, stop. Over and over and over. Why would a dad sign? They'd ask, why do you sign? Why? And he says, because I want to communicate with my child. Of course I sign. Um, 
But we felt like, you know, we're signing, she's doing great, she's skipped a grade, she's in kindergarten, she's at this great school, now would be a really good time to have another baby. And wouldn't it be great if this next one were death? Because we're really good at this. So hey, if anyone's up there listening, send us another deaf one, because why put somebody else through this entire process to have to learn from scratch? Just send, we're really good at this, right? And so I'm pregnant, and I go in for my 18-week routine ultrasound. And I just turned down the AFP test, the test where they can tell you if your child has Down syndrome or any sort of you know, stuff going on. I said, I don't want it. And they said, why not? And I said, because if my child has Down syndrome, I don't care. I'm not, there's nothing you can tell me that will have me end this pregnancy. And they said, well, what if your baby is that one in a thousand that has spina bifida? And I looked at my husband. I was like, we don't even know anybody with spina bifida. I didn't say it, but I was thinking. I'm like, one in a thousand, we have that covered. Lee is profoundly deaf. One in a thousand babies, deaf. We got that, right? We're good. You know, what are the odds? So I signed it away. And they said, well, if your next child does have spina bifida, we need to know because they have to have surgery within hours of being born, and they have to be born by C-section. I'm like, we're good. We're good. Um, went in for my ultrasound, and they said, there's something wrong with your baby. There's something wrong with your baby's head. She has water on her brain, hydrocephalus, and we think it's being caused by spina bifida. One in a thousand, and one in a thousand, we get two of them, it's one in a million. We went home and cried and cried. How could this happen? Why would this happen? We already, we did the deaf thing and, you know, we pulled up our boots and we, you know, fought the system and we dropped through and they said, don't sign and we're signing and she's awesome and she's, you know, blown away all of her peers and, and a wheelchair. We're going to do this and be dragging a wheelchair around? Like, really? Really? And we cried and we cried and we cried. And I sat in bed, and I sat up and said, this is exactly how it felt when we found out that Leah was deaf. This is exactly how it felt. And then I remembered sitting on that bed with that little girl looking up at me, wondering, what is wrong, parents? And I imagine Lucy. I imagined our new baby. What's wrong? I just have spina bifida. I've had it like this whole time. Oh, and I thought, could it be true? <laughs> or does it matter if it's true? Like, are we just bigger, better people if we just say that Lucy's perspective is right? That she just has spina bifida. There's nothing wrong with that. How can it be wrong? It's what is. It's reality, you know? We could spend our lives wishing she didn't. And she'd probably spend her life wishing she didn't. And we'd be wasting a couple of perfectly good lives. And so we decided to make a choice. Lucy just had spina bifida. And our job was to learn everything we could about it to give her the most amazing life we could. And this was the year 2000. And I got online because now there's the internet. And it took about five minutes to load any page. <laughs> and there were no blogs, and there was no Facebook, and there was no Twitter. There was just, you had to really search. You ha it wasn't even Google search. You had to really search. And so I was up late, and I was looking for, trying to find images of, of babies who were born with spina bifida because I wanted to know what it would look like. I wanted to know. I wanted to be able to just be there and just be love with my baby when she was born. And, I mean, their spinal cords are typically exposed. And I wanted to see it before I saw my child because I just wanted to hold her and love her and not. <laughs> not judge or be upset. You just be there with her. And I was searching online, and I was searching fetus spina bifida, baby spina bifida, fetal spina bifida, and bingo. I hit this website in Nashville, Tennessee. Vanderbilt University was doing intrauterine repair of spina bifida. Now, some of you are nodding, but this was 11 years ago. And I watched this virtual surgery online, and I was stunned. And I said, I cannot believe they can do that. The repair they typically do immediately after birth, they were doing at 22 to 26 weeks gestation and putting everything back in. 
and then you're on bed rest. And I, was, I called my husband, Aaron, you have to come see this. He comes up, we sit down, we're watching it. I just kept saying, I can't believe they can do that. I can't believe they can do that. And I went to sleep, and I was just seeing it in my mind. And the next day I woke up, and I'm like, I can't believe they can. That's like sci-fi. I can't believe they can do that. They cut you open. They take out your uterus. Okay, they do a C-section, deliver your uterus. And then they open that, and they take out all the fluid, and they save it in sterile containers. And then they put on little tiny microscope glasses, you know, microscopic glasses, and they repair the baby. And then they don't take it out because then it's born. It has to stay inside. And then they put the fluid back in, and they seal you up, and, they put you, and then you're on bed rest until your child is born. Really, sci-fi. And I'm saying, I can't believe they can do it. And suddenly those words change. And I said, I am doing that. I don't even know how. We couldn't even pay our rent that month. And I'm like, I am, I'm, in, I'm in Tennessee. And I cold called the top doctors in the United States and said, I don't want to waste your time, but I don't want to miss an opportunity. My baby has spina bifida, and we'll do anything we can to help her. Now, they originally started this procedure hoping it would say improve leg function. They thought, well, your spinal cord's exposed, you're bumping around in a uterus, you know, um, maybe if we close up their backs, it'll, it'll improve leg function. It didn't. But even better, it improved brain function. When I first had my ultrasound, they couldn't see Lucy's cerebellum. It was pulled so far back in her neck. So if you imagine, there's a hole in your back, you've got your cerebral spinal fluid that's you know, circulating. It's a closed system. Where there's a hole in the back, it's pulling out. And the spinal cord pulls out, and the brain pulls back. And it was stuffed in her neck. It's a, called a Chiari 2 malformation. And um, they said, wow, we don't think your baby has a cerebellum. And I'm like, wow, I don't think you realized I'm in here. Don't say stuff like that, you know. Um, we found out that it was this malformation when they closed up the baby's backs in utero the brain was able to move. It created pressure and pushed the brain back to the correct position. And by the time the child was born, it's myelinated and there. When your brain is stuck in your neck, there are breathing issues, swallowing issues, speaking issues, uh, you know, everything, everything. Four weeks to the day after our ultrasound diagnosing Lucy with spina bifida, Lucy and I became the 82nd mommy baby patients to have fetal surgery for spina bifida in Nashville, Tennessee. That was scary. <laughs> just, I, I just, I'm glad we weren't number one, because really, we have an idea. <laughs> I don't know that I could have done it. 80, 80 had gone before me. I felt pretty good about that. So they did the surgery. We flew back to California, and I was on bed rest for 10 weeks with a deaf toddler. I do not recommend that. We watched Beauty and the Beast in Spanish, for some reason, hundreds of times together while I was on bed rest. Me and Leah, she didn't care. I don't know Spanish, so I don't know. Um, Lucy was born eight weeks early. She was four pounds, 11 ounces. And um, her first nine months, she screamed. And her hands were in fists, and her head was thrown back. And at nine months, she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And I went home and cried. And then I remembered nothing wrong. She just has cerebral palsy and learned everything I could about it. And we went on. Well, at this same time, now Leah was four, and I was noticing something going on in Leah's world. When you're deaf and you're two and you're in the sandbox, it doesn't really matter because they're all deaf when they're two and they're in the sandbox, right? They're just parallel playing. Who cares? When you're four and you're deaf and you're at the park, it's a different story because someone says, hey, do you want to go on the slide? And she would look and say, Bobby, what are they? And they would go, you have the plague. You know, like they look at her like, what? I'm, mm, and they're gone. Bobby, what'd they say? Mm, nothing. <laughs> they're gone. And I just noticed she was getting invited to fewer and fewer places. Even people who knew us, like good friends of ours, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't invite Leah to my kid's birthday party. I mean, it was a movie. I didn't know if she'd like it. We took, her, took the kids to the theater. No, she would hate it. A giant screen of visual information and popcorn and soda. She'd hate it. Seriously, you know, come on, just because she can't hear it. And so, you know, other people would say, well, you know, I, we'd invite her over, but like, how will we know if she needs to go to the bathroom? Like, okay, it's pretty universal. They like start crossing their legs and bouncing around. Really? You aren't inviting my kid over because of silly things like this. And I imagine in her future, it was just going to get worse, right? She's just going to, what? When they're teenagers, it's going to be really easy to invite her over, invite the deaf kid over. Well, I was thinking about this and trying to come up with a way, just some, like, uh, something new, just trying to come up with something. And Leah, one day, was out on the soccer field, and um, she was four. She played soccer. 
and all the kids are pretty much deaf when they play soccer too. You know, you're like, get the ball, and they're like, oh, a dandelion, you know. <laughs> no, the ball, you know, and they don't care. They're on my, yeah, it's true. And she was the only deaf kid out there. I was out mom interpreting. And um, the coach was teaming up the kids and said to this little boy, I want you to be Leah's partner. And, and he said, I don't want to be with Leah because she can't even talk and she can't understand me. Now, if you happen to have a child with a disability, you, you kind of know that sometimes we walk around with a chip on our shoulder, just a little chip right there. What? You have to educate the whole world about everything? Yeah, you might have to educate the whole world about everything. You know, you may as well just step into it. Um, and I was, I was bugged a little. I was like, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say, you know, all the first stuff, those reactions that come up. And then I stopped and I thought, you know what? He just told the truth. He just said what's been going on that I haven't been able to put my finger on. I don't want to be with Leah because she can't even talk and she can't understand me. Okay. I didn't interpret that for her, just so you know, because I'm a mom interpreter and I can choose to filter it out. <laughs> but I thought about it. And I called his preschool, and I said, hi, my name is Rachel Coleman. And they didn't care because I, it was just Rachel Coleman. It wasn't like, Rachel Coleman, you know, there was nothing. I was just the deaf kid's mom, you know, hi, I'm Rachel Coleman. Yeah, I'm, my daughter Leah's deaf, yeah. I was wondering if I could come do a sign language story time at your school. Oh my gosh, yes, we would love it. It's language, and it's arts, and it's literacy, and it's just so much fun, and singing, and sight. oh yes, please come in. So I went in. And I just sat down with these kids at circle time, and I did brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? You know, basic signing stuff, and just to see what would happen. After one week, I'm out on the soccer field with Leah. We're wa I'm waiting. She doesn't even know, you know. And I see his car, this little boy's car, pull up. And I see him jump out of the car, and he comes running up the field, and he says, friend, play ball. <laughs> and he was so proud of himself, four years old, friend, Play ball. That's all it took. That's all it took to bridge the gap. He didn't take ASL 101. Nope. He had three signs. Armed with three signs, he wasn't afraid of my child anymore. And I thought, you know what? I could do something with that. That made a difference. And I could do something with that. And I thought, I could go to every preschool in all of Los Angeles and do sign language story times. <laughs> And as she graduates each year, I'll go to first grades in the neighborhood and then second grades and third grades and I'll have Lucy in a sling, you know, and I'll, with her CP and I'll just, that's what I'm going to do with my life because that would make a difference for her. <laughs> and thankfully, my sister Emily called me that week. She lived in Virginia. I was in L.A. She's Alex's mom, um, my little nephew who was signing at nine months. And she said, Rachel, I have an idea. Do you want to make a video for kids and teach them all about music? And I said, yes and no. When we found out Leah was deaf, I stopped writing songs and I put my guitars away and I couldn't imagine a place in our lives where music and sign language could fit. And it seemed like a big waste of my time to spend hours with my band when doing something she couldn't even access. So I said, yes, let's make a video for kids. And no, it's not going to be music. It's signing time. And she said, oh my gosh, you're right. And I was like, I know, <laughs> this time I am. <laughs> and we sat down with our kids. It took us a year to make the first video of signing time because we were doing it part-time. We used our credit cards. She was in Virginia. I was in L.A. And we did production in Utah most of the time. Alex and Leah, her son, my daughter, were going to star in the show. Leah was four. Alex was three. We actually finished a complete edit with them teaching the signs, and they were terrible, just so you know. A four-year-old and a three-year-old, not so great at teaching signs. It kind of went like this on, on set. Alex, sign cat. No, sign it longer. <laughs> Alex, I need you to sign cat twice. OK. Alex, will you sign cat? I already signed cat! And he'd storm <laughs> off. But he was only two, really, when we first started filming. Leah was even worse. Leah, will you sign more? No, sign more again. Of course, because I'm signing to her. Sign more again. She signs more again. No. Sign, copy me. I'm like, ah, you know. And so my sister Emily said, you're in. You are her mother. You are signing. I'm like, I, I am not doing this. And if you've ever seen the first video, like the original first video where I'm not in orange, I'm in red and I'm horrified, and I don't say a word, I'm like, 
get me off the stage. Yeah, so that was 10 years ago. And I really thought, wow, if we made 100 copies of this video and gave it away to people who know and love Leah, that would change her world. My sister was a little smarter. She bought a website, signingtime.com. <laughs> but, you know, every time we saw Grandpa, he'd ask, Rachel, how do you sign Grandpa? I said, Dad, she's four years old. It hasn't changed. It's still Grandpa. And I thought, you know, just to give it to the people who know and love her, that will change their experience with her. So I'm going to show you a little bit of signing time, okay? All right. So have any of you seen signing time? Let me see. Okay. A few of you have seen. So I'm in orange, and I have colors on my fingers. Do you know why I have colors on my fingers? Colors on my fingers. Because on TV 10 years ago, if I got to the ABCs, A and S and T and N and M would all look like a fist. Okay, so it's another visual level of reference for people who don't know sign language. It's also just to make interpreters angry. Just kidding. <laughs> They're like, why do you have colors on your fingers? All right, hang on a second. So in signing time, I come out, I'm in orange, I've got colors on my fingers, and I teach the words on the screen, so written out colors, right? So you're reading it. Colors, if you can hear, you hear someone say, colors, and then I come out. This is the sign for colors. Wiggle your fingers on your chin. Colors, sign it with me. Colors. Okay, come on, come on. Colors. This is not TV, you guys. Colors. Sign it with me. I do a pretty good Rachel Coleman, don't I? Yeah, yeah, okay. Colors. Okay, so if I'm talking about colors and I make this sign, what do you think it is? It's rainbow. That's right. Now, we have colors of the rainbow. The first one is this. It's red because your lips are red. Sign it with me. Sign it with me. Your lips are red. Now, I need a helper who can come up and be red with me. I know you're all dying to do it because that's how grown-ups are. If you were four, if I said helper, your hand would already be in the air. You'd be like, hey, yes, I want it. I don't even know what you're going to ask me to do. I need a helper. Come up and be brave. Who can do it? And Okay, back there. Come on up. Yeah, I know grown-ups love to be in front of people. It's crazy. All right, so when I say red or I sing red, will you sign red? Oh, she's only doing it because she loves my videos. Do you know the song? No. Okay, good. All right, right here. So show them all red. Red. Okay, so if I say red, you sign red. Okay, the next color is orange. You're going to open and close your fist under your chin. Let me see it. Orange. Who's going to be my helper and sign orange? You're wearing orange right there. Come on up. Yeah, yeah, you in orange. Yay. Okay, come on up. And this is orange right here under your chin. Okay, I need you guys to scoot down or I'll be in front of the screen. Red, orange. The next is yellow. You use your thumb and your pinky and you shake them. It's yellow. Let me see. Who wants to be yellow? I know you're just dying to come up and, oh, this front row. You're yeah, mm, mm, right here. Come on and be yellow. Red, orange, yellow, green. Use your thumb. Oh, back there. Do you want to be green? Come on up. Yep, come up and be green. Red, orange, yellow, green. Purple, make a two. Stick your thumb in the middle. Plop it over. That's the sign for purple. Uh, when you're shaking it, it is. Okay, who's going to be my purple? I know. Oh, so many hands. So many hands. Helpers right here. Come on. You knew it was you, didn't I know. You are. She put on her coat. I'm wearing purple, but I'm wearing black now. Red, orange, yellow, green, purple. All right. I need blue. Will you come be blue? I don't, it's not in our rainbow. Come on up and be. Oh, oh, come on. Come on. Be blue. Red, orange, yellow, green, purple, and blue. You're blue right here. Okay. So hang on. Let's make sure this is going to work, right? We are. You guys have a job, too. Your job is to ask, do you? So point up here. Do you? No, because the things you know you keep in your head. The colors of our rainbow. Okay. Now you guys get to find, too. Do you know the colors of our rainbow?
I have blue and a purple out of order. You can make the rhyme for purple, you can have my job. Do you know the colors of our rainbow? Do you know the colors of our rainbow? There's red, orange, yellow, green, purple, and blue. Alex knows the colors, Leah knows the colors, and now you know the colors of our rainbow, too. Hold on a second, I've got something for you guys. Well, thank you for helping me out. Here you go. It's a little signing time autograph card and tattoo. So there you go. I can't get too close to that speaker. It'll feed back. So come on over here. See? Yeah, you'll pass them down. Perfect. Now you can sit down. Thank you for being the bravest people in the room. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So we made signing time, and it looks like that. And um, we now, let's see, it's been 10 years since that first signing time, which makes Leah 14, Alex 13, um, I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Um, and we have over 30 DVDs. We've been on public television since 2008. I was nominated for an Emmy Award for television in 2008. Like, no, that's crazy. Like, imagine you got nominated for, that's what it feels like. I was like, what? Me? I'm a mom. I'm a mom. I'm just singing and doing this for my kid. Are you crazy? And we've been on Nick Jr. Nick Jr.'s had our music videos airing for a couple of years as well. So 30 DVDs, we've got baby signing time, all kinds of products based on themes. And you know, it's so crazy because now there are families that use, everybody's signing with their kids, even if your children are hearing, they're just doing this. So there are families using signing time and watching it on PBS with their kids, and then they have a deaf child. Like children are being born into signing families because it's on TV, we, this is fun, we love this. Um, so time goes on, and I, I'm doing signing time, and I go to this conference in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I'm selling signing time, and I notice there's a cochlear implant booth. Now, I had a very, very specific stand on cochlear implants. I would never do that to my child. And if you recall, when we first found out she was deaf, I said, no thanks. She's doing just great. In fact, I was doing signing time playgroups, and when I would see kids with implants, I felt sorry for them. I felt like their parents don't understand them and accept their deafness. And I felt really sorry for them. Um, I was in this conference, and I saw this booth, and I went over and I said, you know, my kid is deaf. It's been six years since I've even, con like, since I didn't consider an implant. <laughs> and tell me what's new. And she said, well, I'm deaf. And, I have and we were talking, and she was, I met some kids who were implanted, and I was blown away. I was so anti-implants, you guys. I mean, I was like, I would never do that to my child. And suddenly I saw like this little ray of, she has everything. What if I actually gave her everything? Signing is a tool, or hearing aids are a tool. What if she could hear something? She skipped a grade. She's like the smartest deaf kid I know. What if we, uh, and it was almost, I, I couldn't even say it out loud. I mean, it was like, I took the information and I like stuck it down my pants and went back to my table because what if somebody saw Rachel Coleman from Signing Time with cochlear implant information in her hand? Are you kidding me, right? And I called my husband from this hotel. I was like, Aaron, I, we, I'm thinking about, thinking about possibly having a conversation about considering maybe <coughs> implanting Leah. And he was silent. He's like, if you would even say those words, in fact, those words are even coming out of your mouth, I'm blown away. We'll have a conversation when you get home. I called my sister Emily and I said, I'm about to sink signing time. And she goes, what are you talking about? What did you do? <laughs> and I said, I'm thinking about possibly considering having a conversation about looking at potentially getting Leah a cochlear implant. And she said, so? And I said, well, you don't understand. You don't understand how it is to be a parent of a deaf child. You don't understand how it is to have your kid to go to a bye-bye school. And you have people saying, you have to choose, and you have to choose before they're two. And you can't ever change tracks. You can't, because you'll ruin them. You know, professionals who don't have to live with the choices saying, you have to choose, and you're going, I just want to do what's best for my kid, and I really want to follow their lead, and they're only one, and I don't know what their lead is yet. But I don't want to ruin them for the rest of their lives either. She said, Rachel. Who should be signing with their kids? And I said, everybody. And she said, what's your stand on cochlear implants and ASL? And I said, I'm probably the only person on the planet who will say that cochlear implants and American Sign Language are not mutually exclusive. And she said, so what does that have to do with signing time? And I said, thank you. And I went home, and we had a conversation with Leah. 
I said, Leah, do you know what a cochlear implant is? And she said, no. <laughs> and she was seven years old. And here I am, like, standing this hard line of, like, deaf, oral, ASL, never the two shall meet, you know, like, battlegrounds, trying to get every family to sign, no matter what their situation is. But, like, I'd never do that to my kid. And I said, Leah, it's like a hearing aid. You've seen kids at your school and at playgroups, and they, they're a little... Beep, beep, they're light. They, it's like, no, no, no. I, okay, so a cochlear implant, it's like a hearing aid, but they do surgery, and it might help you to improve your speech so that when you talk, people could understand you. It might. And it might help you to improve your listening skills so that when people talk to you, you understand them. And she just looked at me and she said, when can I have that? You mean when I talk to Grandpa? He'll understand me, and I'll understand. When can I have that? And here I was thinking I'm doing her this big favor. You know, you are totally deaf, and it's perfect. And it is, and it's perfect and fine, and you don't need this. I'm not even going to tell you about these other things, because what if it didn't work? What if it failed? What if, ah, what, what if people hate us all of a sudden because we implanted our kid, because we wanted her to hear something? Like, is it so terrible? Like, it's so ridiculous to have to stand these lines and, and do what's best for your kid and answer to people, professionals going, well, you're not going to sign with her now, are you? No. And you go home and sign. Like, we're signing in secret still. You know, like, we get in trouble for it. No, no of course I'm not going to sign with her. Why would I sign with her? It's her first language. We went in for an evaluation, and they turned her down. And they said she's a terrible candidate for a cochlear implant. She's never had speech therapy. She has no, you know, she has no spoken words that are understandable. And we're turning her down. And now, here I am fighting for a cochlear implant. Are you kidding me? You can't turn my kid down. You've never even seen a kid like Leah Coleman. The only reason she has the skills that she has is because we've worked as hard as we've worked. And if you do implant her, you can guarantee that we'll work on this side of things. She can't hear. Why would we try and get her to talk? If she can hear, we'll totally work on speech. That's not a problem. And they went through, and Leah, at seven years old, got a cochlear implant. She was mainstreamed the next year. Leah is one of the most amazing implant recipients I've ever seen. They turned her down because she's a terrible candidate. Okay? In fourth grade, she came home from school and said, Mom, I want to compete in the spelling bee. And I was like, oh, this is a bad idea. You're deaf. Remember that part? You're deaf. She still had an interpreter in school. She said, no, I want to compete. I said, Leah, what you don't understand is they can't, some of the words don't have signs. They can't spell it for you if you don't know the word. 30 kids, 29 of them hearing, okay? Fourth grade, 10 kids. Fifth grade, 10 kids. Sixth grade, 10 kids. Leah is a fourth grader, and she's deaf. Mama, I want to compete. So she studied that list. She knew the definition so that the interpreter could sign the definitions. And here you go. This is Leah's 2007 spelling bee. Um, your terrible candidate for a cochlear implant. Bizarre. Bizarre. B A Z A A R. Charisma. C H A R I S M A. Charisma. Proton. Gorgeous, 
She won. If I thought she was going to win, I would have brushed her hair and sent her to school and tied her clothes. How about this young lady? Leah Coleman is your 2007 Spelling Bee Champion. Now it's on YouTube, and her hair is sticking up, and she's in sweatpants. I'm that mom. It's okay. So sometimes, you know, we think, oh, I don't want you to fail. And so we don't give our kids the opportunity to win. Um, I've learned so much <laughs> just from having my girls. I mean, it's so unexpected how our lives have turned out. And like I said, like everything, that they, when she got her implant, her ENT said, now you need to stop signing with her. And I said, you know, that would be abuse in my opinion. She just had major surgery and to stop communicating with her would not be nice. We never have stopped signing and we never will. She always has communication at her fingertips. Lucy's first communications were through her sister's language, sign language. Her hands were in fists. She had no fine motor skills. Her neurologist said she will never speak and she will never sign. And Lucy proved them wrong. Her first sign was more. Her next sign was water. I don't know that I would have thought to sign with a child who had no fine motor skills if she had been born first. But Lucy was born into a signing environment. I've got one more song for you guys, and then I'm wrapping up. Um, it's a song I wrote for Lucy called Caterpillar Dreams, and it's a story about caterpillars. And imagine, go back before preschool, that you don't know caterpillars become butterflies. And you're a caterpillar, and you see these butterflies, and you think, I want to do that. And you tell your best friend, and you tell your parents, and you tell everyone around, and everyone around tells you you can't. You don't even have legs, let alone wings. And yet, our little caterpillars do become butterflies. And what I found is so often it's sign language that gives them their wings. I think when people see me, they see a little girl in a But when I see myself, I see it even from a little girl. Tiny and green, crawling around, head full of dreams, inch by inch, takes all day. I'm dreaming of wings and flying away. Just a little caterpillar down on the ground. I climb a tree and hang upside down. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for spending this afternoon with me.